the, the list is quite expansive, and I will also cover his team as well. Uh, Patrick Doherty, uh, graduated from Fontbonne with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Patrick, can you raise your hand? Hey! Sorry, turning the page. Then we have Isaiah Eichen, is a senior in Computer Science at Fontbonne University as well. And then we have James Gall, graduated from Fontbonne University in May of 2016. Without further, uh, further ado, I give you Dr. Albert Carlson and his research team from Fontbonne University. Well, thank you for coming today. I know you're going to have a lot of fun with all the math we put up here. And uh, as you will discover, the math really isn't all that terrible or all that hard. And what we're doing is actually a lot easier than you would think. One of the things that we're hoping to convey to you today is there's a type of attack that's been developed over the last couple of years called the collision attack. And in this collision attack, what we're actually doing is we're looking at collision of the ciphertext and we're deriving data from the ciphertext. Uh, this was first discussed by two of us here in the United States who are uh, working on similar type projects and actually I got beat to publication by Dave McGrew out at Oracle which really bummed me out. I was really sad because as a matter of fact we came up with dead center on the same equations, used the same variables and he got me, he got me. But our team uh, was able to demonstrate uh, what happened with the collision attack, and it's the first practical demonstration of the collision attack. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do is a couple definitions here as we get started. The collision attack has to do with collisions. Now, most of you are familiar with collisions, and I hate to say this, in my grad class that I was teaching, um, I got a report on it from a number of my grad students who said that Dr. Carlson was talking about car crashes. And we were not. <laughs> Typically a collision is, is known uh, in the world of hashing where you collide a couple of indices and things, well, you know, they kind of fall over each other and you get the same data in and out. Well, what we're looking for in this particular application is we're looking for ciphertext of the same value. Uh, that uh, really, it sounds like that is a trite thing, but if you do randomization, you find that supposedly they're going to spread these outputs from your ciphertext and you're supposed to get lots and lots and lots of different outputs. Turns out you don't. If you look at uh, encryption and language as an IRV, which it isn't, and it was perfect, you'd supposedly get lots of different kinds of data. Well, it turns out that it clumps and that gives us a lot of information. Now, <clears throat> this is the official definition up here that you can see of a collision. The collision basically is the encryption of two uh, plain text uh, blocks with some randomization that actually come out the same. Now, these randomization values typically aren't the same thing because you have like an initialization vector or something that's being fed forward into the encryption system in order to make it look different, but it typically doesn't uh, work that way. It turns out that they still collide quite a bit. All right. <clears throat> well, you're going fast. <laughs> Gotta slow down on that. Okay, so, <clears throat> did it go that fast, actually? Oh, I did, yeah, I did. So they collide. Now, you can get uh, a lot of information coming from these collisions. And the types of information that we see include, oh, and by the way, if you have questions, yell them out. We'll try and repeat them and answer them as they come up because typically holding questions about encryption to the end just makes everybody forget the question, right? So go ahead and yell them out if you have them. Well, we can get metadata, we can get the, the language of the original message, and as a matter of fact, our research has shown that all we have to do is look straight at the collisions and we can typically tell the size of the block that is used for the encryption and also the language, the original language uh, that the encryption came in. And like I said, all that without having to decrypt a single thing. 
So we're, we're going to be presenting more talks on that too. We can also tell the size of the alphabet that's being used, and we can also take a look at something that Andrew Queens Morton uh, talked about back in the 70s, and that's stylometry, uh, which is the habits of, of the people who actually created the system, and we can sometimes even go as far as showing who the author is just by looking at these blocks without having to decrypt. All right? So, um, in this case, so what we're going to do here today is we are going to show you how you can practically use a collision attack to attack something that is using a feed-forward encryption system such as that of Cypher Block Chaining Mode, CBC. Uh, you're, we're going to go about doing this using a, some set theoretic estimation, which is using the mathematics field of set theory to kind of break it down and look at the individual pieces of information rather than looking at the message of a whole, which will allow us to find the information we need to derive what we're looking for. So for a little bit of background, if you look up here, you'll see the general model for CBC. And as you can see, it starts off, you've got your plain text, and you're going to mix that with the initialization vector. And then from there, each block after that is seeded by the output of the previous encryption. This is why we call it a feed forward, because it's feeding it forward. So in when, when you're looking at these, uh, when you, according to Kirchhoff's principles, they're is using this secret called the, that we saw called the initialization vector, which is what kind of kicks the whole thing off. Um, it's what gets you to, it, it's what kind of sets the tone for how strong your encryption is going to be. And this is usually a very long and random number of some sort. Uh, so while this is very random and people tend to t take this to mean that it's very strong, it can be followed. And you, because it follows an algorithm, you can start to trace it back and start to get to the message that you're looking for. So the two secrets that you're usually talking about when you come to encryption are the initialization vector and the key. And because the initialization vector is so random, uh, people don't worry about hiding it. But this is where we kind of started to come in because, because they're not hiding it, this lets us, this sets the tone so that we can begin to follow it back algorithmically and the encryption is not as secure as they expect it to be. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the CBC structure. The CBC structure has one point in it that people haven't explored very well. On that point, we marked X. Why did we mark X? Because, well, of course, X marks the spot, right? You guys are really doing well, you know, with these, these, these inside jokes. You know, X marks the spot, so it's X, right? <laughs> okay, it turns out that that point that we're looking at is the one right after the XOR, of the, of the initialization vector or the feed uh, forward from the last stage. And uh, the plain text, that point con constitutes what's called a relative invariancy. And that means that we can tell the information from there because if you have a collision at CT0, in this case we're just saying CT0 and CT1, but we can kind of uh, generalize that with CTI and CT sub J. If those two are the same, guess what? So is X sub I and X sub J. Now why do we know that? Because all encryptions are one-to-one -one and onto, right? If they weren't, they wouldn't be much of an encryption. What they would be is a permanent destruction. So now we've got a very simple thing there. That means that we've got some data, okay? So what we do is we look at this, and let's, let's do a little math here. I know this is just terrible. My kids at school hate the math class, and they hate Dr. Carlson because I make them do math, okay? Well, we can say that for any of those points x, x sub i is equal to ct of i minus 1, or the ciphertext that came from the stage before it, xored with the plain text, of that particular block. Okay, 
So we know that if x sub i is equal to x sub j, we're going to get ct c t sub i equal to ct sub j. And further, we can go in there and say, with just a little bit of substitution, that ct of i minus 1 x ord with pt sub i is equal to ct of j minus 1 x ord with pt sub j. Now this is really terrible, horrible math, isn't it? We've done a little bit of algebra so far mixed with, uh, with some discrete mathematics. Okay, now, while that doesn't seem like it gets us much, let's simplify it a little bit differently and say that ct of uh, i minus 1 x ordered with ct of j minus 1 is equal to pt of i um, and x ordered with pt of j. Now, once again, I'm sure this looks really exciting and important to you. But let's think of it in terms of sets, because my specialty happens to be sets. So I guess I look at everything as if they're sets, right? That's going to give us a set of plain texts that we can look at and eliminate those plain texts, which when they're XORed together, the pair when they're XORed together, doesn't give us that CT output, OK? If we do this, we have now eliminated approximately half of the plain texts. It turns out that only those pairs that we were talking about here are going to be possible. So now we've started to eliminate the input set. Okay, um, one more, yeah. And it turns out that each time, is, if, if you take a look at this, the number of collisions that are, are required to, to do this over and over and over again, let's say we have multiple collisions of I, J, K, and on and on and on. If we keep I constant in these pairs, we're going to eliminate about half of each, each time. You intersect that together, and guess what? First time you get rid of half, the next time you're down to a quarter, and the next time you're down to an eighth. How long does that take to get through? Well, log base 2 of the size of the alphabet. And you have an answer on the average. It means that you can unambiguously tell what PT sub i is. Now, I know we'll, we'll, we'll use a, a couple of very simple examples here, right? The first one is, let's say we're using the English alphabet, lowercase only. We have 26 characters. That means in order to break that, we need to have five collisions on the average. Five collisions. But of course, let's say you go up to a block of two, that's 676. How many collisions do you need? Nine. Starting to see how this adds up here. We just don't need too many of them. And that means that, that we need a lot fewer collisions than you'd expect. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one thing that we want to say is we would prefer that the plain text of these blocks is different. We don't always get to choose that because sometimes they will accidentally collide in CBC if the plain text is the same, but generally it's not going to be that way. Well, it turns out that we can rework this equation a little bit. So let's say that we know plain text sub i because we've already broken it. If we do that, then any other character that collides with pt sub i in there, or not, let me try that again. I got the wrong one. ct sub i. Any block that collides with ct sub i, we can directly read in plain text. Doesn't matter if it's the same plain text character. Doesn't matter anything. We will read it. Okay. Now, I want to note, I want you to note one thing that these equations have all missed. Right? There is one variable that never appears in any single one of these equations. And that variable is the encryption. This means that the technique that we're using is completely agnostic to the encryption type. This means we can break AES as simply as we can break a substitution cipher, a shift cipher, or a permutation cipher. Notice it does not care how big the key is. So long as you have enough collisions, 
you will break CBC. This should also tell you that the information that is contained inside the randomization and that regular form that we saw of CBC, there is so much information in there that we don't need to break the encryption. We can take it straight out. And then we have an alternate thing that we noticed as well. Now here we've talked about collisions, but what about all those doggone blocks that don't collide? Are they worthless to us? The answer is no, they are not. Because we can also use the negated form of this equation. That means if we know what PT sub i is, for any PT sub i, we can go through all the other non-colliding blocks and we can eliminate one of the plain text combinations. So if you get six or seven of these out into the open, you've already nailed a major amount of information coming back. This will make your plain text work uh, easier. It will make your brute forcing easier. Your whole world is easier because of that negation. And since most of these collides will not, or most of these blocks will not collide, you get a huge amount of information actually from the non-collisions as well. So we get information on both sides of the collision. This is tremendously important when you're trying to break a cipher, isn't it? You sit there and it is a lot of fun. It's still you. Is it still me? Okay, all right. So, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> that means that in either case, one way or the other, we're going to derive information from each of those blocks. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Just imagine what happens if you've got a megabyte of data. <laughs> it really does do huge things. All right, is it whose turn is that? All right, now since the key to this attack is how many collisions we get, it's important that we can determine, or guess at least, how many we're going to get for a given uh, set of ciphertexts. And this is where the birthday paradox comes in. Uh, for those who don't know, the birthday paradox is a study on how to determine the odds of two people in a group sharing a birthday. And uh, we can apply this same thing to any random system. So. It turns out that, according to the birthday paradox, you won't, we only need 6% of the total alphabet, or the total possibility of blocks, to get a 50% chance of a collision. And having only 16% of the total gives us a 99% chance. Um, this attack will be useful for any um, cipher mode that in incorporates feed forward or feedback, including those listed on the screen. All we need to do is adjust for the algorithmic differences, which are subtle at best. Um, one of the major things we've discovered is that there's a very key difference using this attack on linear ciphers. That is, any cipher that uh, does not cross byte boundaries when doing its transformations. So these things include like an XOR cipher, a fine cipher, shift cipher, or any combination of those in a, in a single encryption system. With those, since they don't cross byte boundaries, we can, instead of colliding the entire block, collide only uh, by index within the block. So instead of, say, where we, you said two or three block size blocks or bigger, where you've got, start getting to thousands of possible combinations, there's only, for a given run-through, a given index, we only need to look at 256 possibles, the ASCII set. So that means, given 256 blocks, we will get at least one collision, guaranteed, but most likely we'll get far more. Um, the, this uh, attack is um, independent of the encryption, although some encryptions do randomize a little bit better, but the only real differentiating factor is the block size. For linear ciphers, a bigger block size will actually make this run faster, assuming there's sufficient data to get a collision. And we've done this attack quickly on laptops. So here's um, a 
chart of some of our experiments. The file used in this experiment was about a megabyte in size, and we used a block size of 512 bytes. The uh, key size, the keys and IVs were all generated randomly, and as you can see, we've consistently got at least some breakage of the cipher. Now, some ciphers are more regular than others, and in case of like XOR, it's regularly weak. But the ones that are irregularly irregular shows us that uh, there are weak keys and weak IVs, and we can actually use this technique to determine whether or not a key and IV are weak for a given cipher. Um, not quite. Go back. Um, one thing that this table does not show is that uh, what this table shows is only characters that were completely revealed by this break. What it does not really show is the characters that were narrowed down to maybe one or two in the ciphertext before we, we just discarded those for now. But odds are good that a lot of the stuff in the unbroken still have been narrowed down significantly before I've, the algorithm we used just discarded them for the moment. And we'll continue to look at that in the future. I continue. So <clears throat> we uh, have some video evidence here. Uh, this is a linear cipher break that we did for it, and it should be playing here, I believe. And oh, there we go. There. So this is just a process. It goes through and it creates its library of what it needs to break and then sorts each of the blocks. On the right side, I believe the top, the top is the encrypted text, and the bottom is the decrypted text. Um, and the decrypted text is almost as similar to the original. Um, I think this, I think this one was the, let's see, depends on how long it's taking. So this is, this break took about 18 seconds, I believe, in total. So, oh, I'm sorry, 28 seconds. Um, and we have since worked on this and we've gotten it down to about five to eight seconds on these. Uh, and this is another video that is uh, linear as well. I believe this one is a perm XOR. And it goes through, creates a library again, and then sorts into its blocks. Um, and I believe it was, uh, this one was the 18 second. And the linear cipher does take a bit longer, um, but that'll be the last video. Or, yeah. Encryption is very exciting to watch. It's proof of life on the screen, so you know it's doing something. So, oh, I'm sorry, 22 seconds on that one. So, as it was done on a six-year-old laptop that is not that high-tech. It's pretty old, and we broke it pretty handily. So this is the nonlinear that is a bit longer. I think it was a total of a 30-minute break. The video is not 30 minutes long. We cut it down. So it goes through and basically counts the number of blocks that it has, um, and then sorts them into different, sorts them into different collision groups, and then it will then sort through them and break. <clears throat> it's very exciting. We, shut off the we did shut off the sound, so. If you have the sound on, it likes to play different noises because it'll when it prints out all the text, the the symbols basically there are sometimes sound characters in there, so it'll play the sound characters as well. Because when you encrypt something, you can get a sound character because it is a valid character. It's not nice like music. No, it's mostly dings. You could imitate it for us if you want. No, you. you could. Oh no, we don't. Need to imitate it. <laughs> So it's finished sorted there, and then I believe it goes on to compare them, and then after that it asks if we want to do a brute force, which is, I believe, yeah, it's at the brute force now, and then it, basically we, we eliminated portions of the block, block space, the key space, and then we do a brute force attack, since it's a limited size, it's not a full key size, we have portions of it, and the brute force takes less time than it normally would. So it total was 1,311 seconds, which I think comes down to 21 minutes and 51 seconds. 
So as you can see, it's very effective where it's used. And very little of the original message must be recovered because we eliminate portions of the key space. We can then, from that, deduce what the rest of the message is because we know what it can't be. Um, and it's covered by the birthday paradox and language statistics. In the English language, every word has a vowel unless it's a proper noun, because some of those sometimes don't have vowels in them. But for the most part, it's, I think it's an average of every seven letters you'll have a vowel. And you can use that to characterize where certain letters are going to be. If you have a Q, it's immediately followed by a U unless it's a proper noun in the English language. And so with that, there's enough information in there that it's not exactly random like people want you to believe. Um, and so because of that, linear ciphers shouldn't be used because they are very easy to break. We treat each, basically, we create an index and treat each character individually. Whereas nonlinear ciphers are not as susceptible, but they are still susceptible to this attack if they are, if there's enough data there. One thing I did want to say here is, you know, you ask about how much of the original uh, blocks that we actually have to break in order to be able to go back and make that brute force attack work very quickly. And the answer is we need between 1.6 and 1.75% to be broken. By that time, we've reduced the sets so far that we can just scream through things. 1.75% that are solved, okay? And so the collisions are typically going to be in the range of about 2 to 3% at that, that point. Oh, no, no, they, it happens quite naturally. Yeah, let's see, one of the, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to you in just a second here, yeah. One of the things that, that, that we did find with, uh, with these collisions going through was, um, People have this tendency to believe that because something is an independent random variable, it means that you're going to get a uniform spread of everything. Eh, not really. Okay? It's the roulette wheel problem all over again. We got a collision this time. We have about the same probability of getting a collision next time. And we'll get the same collisions back to back. We've seen all sorts of different goofy collisions, but we see a lot of them. Okay. Okay, the question was, when we examine the ciphertext, how do we see a collision? Yeah, there's one thing that we've made one assumption here that we're going to be able to fix with our next piece of research, and that is that we know how big the block is. So we just cut it up by blocks, and then we compare them. That's all you have to do. Yeah, that's all you have to do. It gets to be pretty simple. Okay, so... <clears throat> One of the things that we talked about earlier and we haven't really harped upon is about the initialization factor. So what if we don't have an initialization factor? Well, the answer is you throw away that block and you use the ciphertext as the initialization factor for the rest of the message. That means that we can start anywhere in a message to do the work. We don't have to start at the beginning. We can start near the end. We can start in the middle. Who cares? Okay, so the initialization vector really turns out to be a non-factor. Okay, big deal. We don't know the initialization vector too bad. You know, and we can probably guess it by the time we finish fitting everything in. Okay, now this is a brand new technique that has only been available for about the last year. Are we, are we worried about, uh, showing our code. The answer is, if you want to see this code, talk to Patrick and the guys afterwards, we'll send it to you. That's how confident we are in it. Does it work? Well, we've tried a few tests. How many tests would you say we've tried, guys? About a uh... lot. Okay, we got the very, very... 5,000 files. We, we tried 5,000 files and a minimum of 2,000 <laughs> runs for each file. Okay, so we call that a lot. It's a very technical term, right? <laughs> well, the, actually, we only need to be able to break. The question was, do we need a seeding amount of information? 
right? And the answer is no. We start with total ciphertext. All we have to break and know for sure is about 1.6 to 1.7 percent after we're finished with this and we can deduce the rest using simple techniques and keeping track of what's in those sets. Yeah. So it turns out that this is extremely effective. Normally when we knock down the, the size of those sets, we get things that are called isomorphs, things that have the same form, right? We're able to use isomorphic reduction on this as, as well as the, the reduction that, that we're talking about here, and we just tear through that information. See, our attack starts out by going, we know what all the possible solutions can be, and we do a Sherlock Holmes on this. You know, anything that we can prove to be impossible, we can throw out because it's impossible. Now, that also means that this technique starts out a little bit slowly and it speeds up with time as we get through, uh, further and further through the processing because it rips out those things that we don't want to know and we have fewer and fewer things to compare and fewer and fewer things to keep track of. So we get faster as time goes on. Now, this is a, a one of those very nasty kinds of of solutions that you don't see very often. And I'm telling you, the only thing that really annoys this uh, particular algorithm is if you use different size blocks in your encryption. Okay, Is this perfect? No, not perfect. Is it close to perfect? Yep. Okay, the question is, why do different size blocks cause a problem? And the answer is because we will get uh, different numbers of collisions and we'd have to keep track and know which ones are different sizes in order to have the blocks correctly aligned. Right. Mm -hmm. So with a, with a polymorphic size type algorithm that changes block sizes, we're going to have trouble figuring out which ones are which and cutting them apart and putting them together in the correct order. Okay. Yes. Is it possible to actually infer the original key? And the answer is yes, of course. Because once we know what the plain text is, we can then uh, produce, uh, by going through the process, we can produce the XOR so we know what the input is, we know what the ciphertext output is, and therefore we can reproduce that key exactly. And so, yeah, we were hoping to have about 10 minutes for questions, and we're actually into that 10 minutes. And I'm, I'm happy for that. So other questions that are going on. Did that answer your question? Yeah, see, we prefer to do things the easy way because we're lazy engineers. Yeah, isn't that what we all do? We all do, we'll, we'll program for years to save a second on something, right? Yeah, we do call it efficiency, and that's what we tell our bosses, right? We are being efficient, but it means we're doing things the lazy way, and we like the lazy way. At least I do. Yeah, go ahead. How much danger is, is AES-256 in with this, right? It is irrelevant of the encryption algorithm. We can break a 256, a 512. And as a matter of fact, we've gone uh, in some of these encryption systems up all the way as far as 2048 bits. Now, what's our biggest problem with this? Well, I need more processing power than those six-year-old laptops. <laughs> yeah, we will accept donations for that if you want us to continue you know, our research there. We really would enjoy that. So the answer is uh, AES-256, given sufficient input, we can break it. Does this mean that CBC is dead? Well, like everything, if you use the encryption correctly, it'll be safe. But we all know that everybody uses the encryption correctly. Yes, I like those laughs because all of us know that one of the reasons that we're in business is because there are stupid people out there. Not just a few, a lot. Yeah, it makes us, it makes us have like fat pickings when we go around and, and break stuff. But the fact of the matter is we can indeed break AES-256. Now, one of the other things that you should think about with this is the, the big problem is getting enough input data, right? Now, 
what if people do not change their keys? Because we know they change their keys every message, right? Right. If they did that, somebody would actually be listening to us. Yeah, and doing it right. But the fact of the matter is, if you know that you have somebody, say, who changes their message uh, key once a day, you can take all those messages, chop off the first block, and push them together. As long as you demark where they are, you have one stinking large file for input. Isn't it nice when people hand you presents and say, hit me, hurt me, make me write bad code? Yeah. Okay. The answer, or the question was, I'll get to the answer in a minute, just so everybody can hear this. The question is, if you can force SSL to, to pick the same uh, key and, and cipher, could you potentially return the private key? Yes, you can. Well, get the messages at least, but you, then, then you can redo the key. You can go back into the key. Yeah, you can. I mean, it's not like I told you before. It's not perfect, but dang it, it's a nice step in the right direction. This is, we believe that, that, that this technique can be used very, very well uh, under many situations to be able to, to bring in information. Now, uh, what I will do here is I'll stop for a minute and I'll take more questions in a minute, but this is where you can reach us. Okay? Yeah. And uh, it's probably easiest to get Patrick and I, uh, now that we have a, a permanent address, we're, we're now living in that place that is called the bottom of a river in Texas. You have not seen rain like we have seen in the last two months. Yeah, so uh, we have that permanent address. Patrick uh, and I uh, will take this all the time. We, we do provide uh, the code and information. We'll talk to you about it, too. We're very happy to talk to you about it. Isaiah and James are more local here, but they have limited time at Fontbonne, so it may be a little harder to get a hold of them. Yeah. Well, uh, what brought the research from Cypherlock to Fontbonne? Right, it was kind of the other way around. <laughs> okay, uh, I was an uh, assistant professor of math and computer science at Fontbonne, and this was one of my pet projects. Uh, I always thought there was too much information in CBC, and everybody told me I was crazy, and it does not obviate the fact that I am crazy, but <laughs> in this case, I was right. <laughs> And so I started a project uh, among my students, and a company came along and said, we really like what you're doing, let us support your research. And then they really liked what we were doing and hired us away, which made us very happy. Yeah, well, it made us substantially less poor, let's put it that way, <laughs> because we all know how much they pay professors, right? And that, that isn't a kick against Fontbonne, that's a kick against academics, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, actually I do. I have, what's our, our, our thing look like now? It's a, it's a 4 gigahertz 8 core with 32 gigs of RAM and right now 20 terabytes of data, but it can be expanded to 40. That's our basic machine there. Okay, I saw another hand. Where was that hand? Yes. Oh, we don't have to, uh, the question was how do you generate collisions? CBC and the cipher generate them for us. We just have to look at the ciphertext data. That's all we have to do. We go ahead. Yeah, uh, there is indeed a variance in, in languages. Um, we're exploring that, and we hope to have a paper out on it soon. Uh, and there is quite a variance in languages. One of the things that's interesting, and I'll get to you in a second here. One of the things that's interesting is you can see a variance just in the number of uh, letters in an alphabet. For, for instance, Russian has 35 letters. And uh, Portuguese has, uh, how many does Portuguese have? 33 or something like that. So we, we do see a difference. Yeah, none of us, uh, we speak, I speak Russian, but our Portuguese guy went back to Brazil. 
So we kind of lost that information. Yeah, some of us speak English, but not many. <laughs> Okay, the question is, could you make things a lot worse by taking other languages, dumping them in as cryptonols, and interleaving them, and would that make it harder? The answer is yes. <laughs> it would. It, it, it certainly would. Because then we'd have issues with how big the original language was and things like that. Could we get around it? Yes, we could. Would it make it harder? Yes, it would. So um, as, as far as that goes, it's a, it's a great way to increase the obfuscation, but uh, we could get around that. I mean, there are some things we can't get around, but... Okay, oh, sorry, I see you, Dave. The, the most practical what? Okay. Uh, the the best thing that you hi folks this is Adrian Crenshaw unfortunately it looks like the Apple Media froze up so we don't have any audio from here out or motion of the speakers sorry for the inconvenience luckily we did get most of this talk.